so I'm out here in Agave Utensis Nevadensis habitat today, and we're, we're talking all about that habitat. We're talking about the, the soil, the mala soil that the Nevadensis grows out of, and what impact that has on the, the size and shape of the, the clumps of Nevadensis and the clonal rings that can grow. And we're also gonna be talking about the really interesting flower structures, the inflorescences that grow from Nevadensis. And we're also gonna be talking about one of my favorite characteristics of Agave Utensis, which is its variety. The fact that, you know, when you walk around in this habitat here, you see thousands of plants, and many of them just feed from each other look totally different. So I'm out here at about uh, 6,100 feet of elevation in the Spring Mountains, uh, a bit further south, or actually quite a bit further south than I was the last time I took you guys all out to habitat. The last time it was in Agave Utensis Eborospina habitat, but today we are in Agave Utensis Var Nevadensis habitat, and actually in one of my favorite areas for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, but today what I want to talk about is just, you know, what the Nevadensis habitat looks like, specifically how it's different from the Eborospina habitat and there's a couple of points to make about that. Uh, and then the other thing I want to talk about is the plants themselves and how uh, the plants differ other than just the, the, the difference in spine length. Everybody knows that Iborospina has the really long spines, Nevadensis uh, has shorter, wavy spines uh, and generally blue reliefs, but there's a couple other differences that I think are super interesting too. But the reason that I'm stopped right here in this specific spot, other than the fact that it's just a, a beautiful day and a beautiful view behind me, is that uh, we often talk about, or I often talk on the channel about how agave utensis, uh, the, the varieties, subspecies utensis, nevadensis, and eborospina are believed to be the result of a relatively recent field hybridization. That is uh, not that many, tens of thousands of years ago, something on that range. Uh, two uh, agaves out in the field fell in love, cross-pollinated and made uh, babies. And that hybridization is actually what we now know of as agave utensis. And, you know, some guesses, we probably will never know exactly what the two parent plants are, plants are that made utensis, but some good guesses are like, Agave utensis subspecies cababensis, which is probably not the result of a relatively recent field hybridization, hybridization, uh, and something like Macalviana or Deserti that at one point probably shared some habitat range with, uh, with cababensis. And the reason that uh, many experts believe that utensis uh, is the result of a relatively recent field hybridization is because of its inflorescence. Generally, species are denoted uh, by inflorescences, right? If a, two plants have different flowers, inflorescence is just a fancy way of saying flower. If two plants have uh, different flower structures, then they're generally considered two different species. Uh, and most species, uh, varieties and subspecies and stuff within a given species will have the same, if not very, very similar uh, inflorescences. Utahensis is a little bit special in that uh, this flower stalk, which is the flowering body of the agave utensis, the inflorescence, can be one of three different kinds of inflorescence. Generally speaking, like I look, there's a whole bunch of uh, flower stalks right in front of me, and I'll, and I'll show more. I'll cut in some B-roll of them into in, in the video when I post it to, to YouTube. Uh, but generally speaking, they're, they're spicket. Nevada, Nevadensis produces spicket inflorescences. That is, there's the one big uh, stalk, and then the flower buds come off directly from it. Spicket being, you know, another word for a spike, right? It's just a, a single spike and then the, the flowers and eventually the seed pods, uh, which you see here, um, grow directly off the uh, the stalk. And then there's also racemic where there's a, you know, a, a central stalk, central tall stalk, and then there's individual sort of branches that come off. And then there's one or two, or even just one flower and fruiting body, eventually seed pod that comes off of that. And that would be a racemic stalk. This right here is the first time that I can remember seeing an agave utensis nevadensis produce a paniculate flower stalk. Now, paniculate flower stalks are much more complex, right? As you can see, and I'll, I'll, I'll cut in some closer B-roll, obviously, but as you can see, there are, from this central flower stalk, there are a number of these much longer branches that themselves have a bunch of flower stalks coming off of, or flowers, uh, coming off now, they're not flowers anymore. They're well, the flowers are dried, but they're um, they're seed pods, they're fruiting bodies now. Uh, but this is the first time that I can remember seeing uh, a paniculate flower stalk on an agave utensis, nevadensis. So yeah, this is that paniculate inflorescence that I was talking about. It's super cool. 
uh, as you can see, uh, there's that central flower stalk, that, that thick central flower stalk. Uh, and from that flower stalk are, you know, long, maybe eight inch, some are, you know, smaller, maybe four inch or so, uh, I guess branches, appendages. Uh, and then now what are those pods, those seed pods, at one point uh, had flowers at the end of them. You can kind of see there's dried flowers now at the end of them. Um, but that's the, that's what a paniculate structure looks like. And these paniculate structures are, uh, you know, as I said, this is the kind of inflorescence that Capabensis grows uh, solely. Um, and, you know, most other agaves grow some form of uh, paniculate, some sort of more complex um, inflorescence structure like this. Whereas Agave utensis nevadensis, which is what this is, Eborospina and subspecies utaensis, generally are thought to grow, you know, any one of the three spigot, racemic, or paniculate inflorescence. And as we pan down to the, the actual rosette of the plant, you see that there is a pretty big um, rosette uh, there that's all yellow now, of course, because Agave utensis is monocarpic, meaning that it flowers once in its life. Uh, and then it dies, this started flowering back in the springtime, it's now uh, late August. Uh, and so it has, you know, uh, dried up, desiccated, turned yellow and dried up. But um, there are a number of other plants right next to it, offsets uh, that are, you know, clones of that plant that were vegetatively propagated uh, that are genetically identical to it and will live on long after uh, the central plant. Cause you can see there's other examples. See that one right there, that white one is, you know, died a long time ago, flowered and died a long time ago. And then as we move over to this side, uh, you see there's another one um, that flowered and died up quite a while ago. So I just thought that was super interesting. Generally, um, as I said, that experts believe that agave utensis is the result of a relatively recent field hybridization because subspecies utensis, Nevadensis and Eborospina have variable inflorescences. They can have one of those three different types, but Cababensis only produces paniculate inflorescences closer to this. Uh, so it's believed that, you know, having only a single flower structure that it produces is an indication that that's the oldest taxa of agave utensis, and thus the ones with variable inflorescences, which is typically a trait you see in hybrid plants, uh, means that this is the result of a, of a re relatively recent field hybridization. And so another thing that I want to talk about while we're out here uh, is the difference in substrate. Now this isn't always 100% because you know I've shown agave utensis growing in uh, on sandstone, and even in here we can see agave utensis growing directly out of cracks in limestone boulders. And when we went to the agave utensis borospina habitat, that's generally what you see more of, which is the borospina plants coming directly out of cracks and boulders without a whole lot of soil surrounding them, right? And so the clumps, they still produce offsets and they still produce small clumps, but the clumps don't have a whole lot of room to, to, to grow and to expand into very large clumps. And here, however, uh, like I said, there are some plants that are growing directly out of cracks in large limestone boulders, but the majority of plants, and again, I'll cut in some B-roll so you can see this, are, are growing from what's called mala soil, right? Uh, and if I reach out and pick some up, make sure I'm not grabbing any bugs or anything, uh, you can see that it's mostly sort of chunks of limestone, uh, but then it's mixed in with um, mala soil, which is a very fertile substrate uh, that is basically the result of like, you know, trees and leaves and branches and roots from other older plants that have decayed and are now contributing organic material to that. But that means that the substrate is, is movable. It's much looser than say a crack in a giant limestone boulder. So because of that, out here you get these large clumps and clonal rings, which I think are super interesting of agave utensils. And here's an example, much smaller example, um, you know, because it comes from a much smaller, you know, actual rosette of agave utensils and vadensis, but the, the inflorescence here, this, this flower structure uh, is both much smaller than the other one, but is also uh, of the uh, racemic variety, right? Uh, from the flower stalk, there are short, tiny little appendages, and then from each one of those, there are several uh, flowers, which are now, of course, seed pods, because it's late August, um, and you can see the dried flowers there. Um, but that's the difference. That's a racemic flower stalk, and I'll see if I can find any uh, spigot flower stalks uh, here to show you the example of in a second. And then again, as we pan down to the bottom, this is also an example uh, of what I was talking about, the, um, this substrate, right? This, this uh, limestone gravel, uh, which is obviously a lot looser and a lot more movable than, you know, just a crack in a limestone face. Uh, and so this plant uh, here 
has undergone the same sort of clumping thing where there was a, you know, one plant at first and it produced offsets and then that plant flowered and died because agave is monocarpic, uh, but its uh, offsets were able to spread out. And so now you have uh, basically, you know, a ring of plants that are all clones of each other. They are genetically identical uh, and they will outlive any one individual uh, plant that has that has flowered here. And so that's something that's different uh, from a lot of times the agave utensis Ebora spina habitat, which generally tends to be confined more to cracks in limestone faces. And so it doesn't quite have that same opportunity to spread out and form these, uh, these agave utensis clonal rings. Uh, which I think are super interesting for a bunch of reasons that I've said, I've got a bunch more content coming about it. But if you think about how old these plants are, right? If it takes, you know, 10, 15, 20, 25 or longer years for an individual plant to flower, and then you start kind of doing the, the, the mental math about how old these rings are, this ring could be a hundred or more years old, which is super duper interesting and super cool. So yeah, and so here out in this specific habitat, uh, you see a lot of really big, both clumps where it's, you know, a solid mass of plants, some are dead, some are alive, and then rings, which are much older, where, you know, you have a ring of, outer ring of um, alive plants, and then you have a central sort of hollow area where um, those plants have long since flowered and died. And, and here's just another example of a, of, of a clonal ring. This one, you can kind of see the shape of the ring a bit more distinctly, right? Uh, it's open at the top. Uh, which is sort of facing up on the slope and that's kind of a common uh, trait of these rings as they grow a little bit older uh, and we'll talk about that more in future videos but this one again you can see the kind of the shape is a bit more um, well defined as a ring the inflorescence is that much more common uh, racemic structure and then you can also see some uh, some cool little uh, auxiliary stalks right uh, these are stalks that are probably growing from uh, offsets that you can't really see because they're, uh, you know, obstructed by the whole massive offsets that are surrounding this plant otherwise, but those were likely triggered to flower by what are essentially plant hormones called auxins. Um, I don't think we know 100%, but I think that's everybody's you know, most expert's best guess of what's going on there. I have a whole bunch of content coming in the future, exploring a bit more and talking a bit more about those clumps and rings and stuff like that, uh, that we will, that I'm really excited to share with everybody. But I just wanted to take some time uh, and come out here and show you all uh, what agave utensis nevadensis habitat looks like. And then another thing that I'm gonna to wanna to show as well, and I don't see any great examples around me directly. I paused, the, the example that I wanted to show is this super cool uh, paniculate inflorescence, um, but is just the variety of agave utensis nevadensis in habitat. Uh, meaning, uh, you know, we'll look at plants, I'll cut in some, some video of some plants where uh, they have super wavy spines, where they have sort of uh, fringed teeth, right? We're very small, but a whole lot of teeth on the, the margins of the plant, uh, right next to mere feet away from plants that have very straight spines or nevadensis, you know, with long spines, longish for nevadensis, maybe not Ebora spina long, but nevadensis long, right next to plants that are um, fairly short spine. So here's an example of that really cool uh, species trait that Gentry noted, the variability of agave utensis and habitat. Here's a, this is a pretty small clump, but as you see, uh, the, the spines on it, the terminal spines there at the end of each leaf are really, really wavy. And if we, we go over here, there's a, an even smaller one that also has those really wavy spines. And these two plants might be uh, clones of each other because they're just, you know, maybe, 12 inches, 14 inches or so from each other. But literally if I just turn around and I come right down here and I look at this plant, you see the terminal spines are pretty straight and actually fairly long for agave utensis nevadensis. So here's, here's an example of one of my favorite traits of agave utensis nevadensis. The, uh, the, the super blue leaves, that glaucous blue powdery, you know, almost white. I'm not sure if it's showing up great on the camera, but this specific plant right here is, is super blue. All the plants out here are pretty blue, but this one is, is really, blue, really, really pale, sort of white gray. I mean, obviously it's a little bit green too, but just love that color in Nevadensis. And then there's a little, little offset that has that same color right next to it. And of course, the main reason I think that Nevadensis specifically of all the agave utensis taxa, has that really cool glaucous blue coloring is, is the fact that it grows mostly way up here in these sky islands, up here, you know, like 6,000 feet of elevation, which is where we're at right now, where it gets a whole lot more UV stress than plants that are growing lower. Basically, you know, the higher up 
in elevation you get, the less UV cover there is, and so the more UV radiation is exposed to the plants, and UV radiation has been shown, specifically UVB, to uh, increase production of a glaucus, that glaucus powdery blue waxy coating that protects the leaf from you know, UV damage. So uh, the fact that Agave utensis nevedensis specifically grows the highest, I'm pretty sure it's the highest growing elevation of all the Agave utensis taxa, I think is the primary reason why most of these plants are are really, really blue and super cool looking. I think that's another reason why agave utensis is one of the coolest uh, plants in existence. And I've, I've said before, it's the best agave uh, because of that variety. Like you can come out here in Habitat, see thousands of plants and see hundreds, if not maybe even thousands of different kinds of plants and see the, the, the wide variety of agave utensis. So I'd love to hear from you down in the comments. What's your favorite trait of agave utensis nevadensis? And what should I cover next here on the YouTube channel? And thanks for watching.